Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Allison Daly and I am your host uh, this afternoon for our developer conversations with uh, Morgan Whaley donor. Um, folks that have been in our tech interview transformation course, you know her as Morgan Whaley, but she is Morgan donor now and I am so thrilled to have her as our guest. Um, this conversation is related to, in relation to our tech interview transformation um, mini course that we have out in the world and Part of that is giving a technical foundation training on the front end, back end, and DevOps stacks. And Morgan is the front end engineering instructor on the recruiting innovation platform. Good to see you again, Morgan. Yeah, Thanks likewise. Good here. to see you too. Like, yes. How long it's yes. Been. Oh my gosh, it's been too long since I've seen your face. We've obviously been connected digitally, but that's kind of the world right now, anyway. <laughs> um, so Morgan, Morgan, and I both are in the Denver. Uh, developers you know community and we've both been um, on the planning committee for the develop Denver conference among other things out there um, she is quite a, a known voice in this community and always a pleasure to be around she can you know introduce herself a little bit more detailed than I can but I just can say that it's been a, it's been wonderful working with you over the past few years Morgan so do you what would you mind uh, oh, introducing you. yourself to us yeah <laughs> No problem. Yes. Sure. Um, um, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my name is Morgan Whaley. I am a Colorado native, live here in the middle of Denver, and spent about 10 years in visual design, graphic design, made the career pivot around uh, 2009, 2010 to web development, start out full stack, and moved toward the front end about six seven years ago almost exclusively and in the past three years have been doing a lot of now hybrid ux strategy work and um, front-end development around that so i currently work for charter communications as a uh, senior ui prototype architect and so what that means in uh in a little more layman's terms is that i help enable our visual designers and ux designers to um build proof of concept research and iterate on their designs more quickly by giving them um, basically working proof of concepts of, of all of their ideas okay and by proof of concept that sometimes also means prototypes is that right mm -hmm. yes exactly and so this could be anything from just seeing how user interactions between a couple different menus works this could be pulling in new data this could be um, using speech recognition for accessibility purposes this could be interfacing with our industrial designers to see how um different product designs could could potentially work with our applications out there um, my main beat is for our video subscribers and so this transcends everything from web to mobile to um, in-home cable box style user experiences and the work right now um, that we're doing is more important than ever as people are using telecom services and video services more and more um, for distance learning, for connecting with family, for entertainment and just escape from uh, from the current situation. So it's been actually a, a huge opportunity. Um, and while the while the current circumstances are, are challenging for everyone, I'm grateful to be in this vertical where we're really trying to use a lot of these powers to help people right now. Big time. And I think I might have seen one of the executives, I think it was Charter, you, you all have always been kind of on the forefront of accessibility as a telecom company, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're seeing a lot more accessibility being mentioned um, in technology and it's about time. But for maybe some of the folks that are a little bit, you know, newer to the space, I know I'm, I'm still like learning what even that umbrella includes. Can you maybe just let us know as an engineer and as a front end person, like what, what does accessibility mean for you and what does it mean in your role now? Yeah, sure. So accessibility is interesting because a lot of people look at it through the lens of, oh, we now have to go back and accommodate for people with disabilities. So this could be people who can't see, people who can't hear. Um, maybe they can see a little bit. Um, maybe they have diminished haptics using a remote control could be difficult using a, a phone could be difficult 
but I think about accessibility less in terms of trying to accommodate a specific group of people and more about the universal design concept, which is that everyone should really be able to use everything that we build. So especially from a tech, from a technology um, perspective, what I do is we have a wonderful um, accessibility team at my office and we bake those interactions in from the start. And so instead of going, okay, we're gonna see if this app works for most people, and then we'll just kind of like shoehorn some stuff in later to see if, you know, we can add some like ARIA tags or, um, or tab navigation or something like that. And instead what we do is we do that very early and then we hold constant accessibility audits. And so for me, that means um, collaborating immediately with our accessibility architects and I'm on, uh, pretty tight terms with one of our senior managers on that team. And so he and I will sit down and jam on a concept. We'll also do a lot of fun little like exploration side projects. Like he, um, he wants to look at writing a blog post around a couple different um, accessibility parameters. And I can't remember off the top of my head what they are right now. Um, but he and I are gonna start going off on some little side quests together and see if we can make those work. Um, on single page applications and complex web pages and then bring those back to the team. So it's been really great to do that. And really when, when we do things like that, everybody benefits. My manager just recently went through this where um, we've been actually building some stuff around using eye tracking software where you could get something that looks like a sound bar and then it calibrates to the positions of your eyes and it can do all different shapes, sizes, um, it can do it through glasses, that kind of stuff. And then you could actually be able to control a computer or TV screen using your eyesight and blinks. And um, it's one of those things where you think like, oh, only certain types of people are gonna need this. And then my boss had a um, herniated disc in a airport and immediately had to go to the hospital and he was stuck in a hospital for three days and he couldn't like reach to pick up anything because it would strain the discs in his back. And he was like, man, this is a situation where a normally, you know, basically fully able-bodied person is going through a very brief period of, um, of disability, of, of this diminished ability to accomplish a goal. Um, and so that's the way that I try to approach this is like, it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that someone has a medically diagnosed disability. It could be that you are in a hospital bed. It could be that your cat is asleep on your arm. It could be that you're holding a child. It could be that for a while you've broken your arm and you're in a sling, you're in a cast somehow. Um, we all go through this at some point in our lives and it's usually very frustrating and difficult. And so, yeah, the way I like to approach it is just what can we do to make everything more convenient and usable for all and to do it as early as possible. And in that case, then it's truly universal, universal design. Mm -hmm. Not just like exactly. design for the 80%. It truly then exactly. becomes the universal. Ah, okay. And I'm just so curious before we go into like the project example, like now, you know, from visual design to web design to front end to now doing a lot kind of like full circle where you're, it sounds like you're interacting a lot with the user experience team and testing. And was that all very natural or have you had to like take certain like intentional uh, steps in your career or choose a different type of job or a different kind of company or is it just sort of like morphed and, and you're in a happy place now? Uh, the short answer is yes. It, it was a little bit of everything actually. Um, so I kind of got into this because I was getting a little bit burned out on tech at the time. This was in around 2016, 2017. I had just started a job as a principal engineer for a very large company and they needed some individuals who had some UX design experience, which I had from previous jobs, working mostly in ad agencies and on smaller ad hoc teams where people kind of have to wear a bunch of different hats and jump in and help folks. Um, and where there were kind of less layers of like handoff obfuscation happening. And so the immediate collaboration really kind of helped facilitate that. So in this company, we were defining a lot of brand new projects from the ground up. And doing a lot of that involved um, the IDEO human-centered design principle, mm -hmm. which is the very UX process, it's like user personas, doing research ahead of time, understanding the what, why, how of what people want to accomplish, and then beginning to do things like build out our feature sets, build out our timeline. And then from there, 
conducting a little more research on the UX side, designing the products. And while the design was happening, we were doing development in tandem. And so both um, that workflow process and my background allowed for that role to kind of morph organically and pull me away from a principal engineering role and more into this kind of higher level development strategist. Um, we never kind of built a job title around it. And this is a, um, it's an interesting company. They sent me to India a couple of times, which was a hugely incredible experience. I got to see what offshore collaboration looks like um, from a technical and a, and a product design side. And then after about a year in that position, I realized that I wanted to continue on that path, but do something a little bit different. And that company was not really going to help facilitate that goal, which is how I wound up at Charter and on this prototyping team. And so, um, yeah, I, I thrive when I get to make new things, bridge the gap in communication and basically be a, be a positive cultural influence on a company. And uh, this job has kind of afforded me all of those things. And so in that process, I did spend some time kind of upping my skills in UX. I took a part-time uh, evening course for about 12 weeks with General Assembly and um, learned a little bit more about the formalities of UX. And it closed the loop on a lot of concepts that I had some basic knowledge of, but, um, but still really wanted to step into. And then from there, uh, basically, yeah, moved into this design team role where I am now on a team of basically um, five prototype developers, or, or we call ourselves design technologists right now. So we have a couple who work on um, our design systems team, and they're doing a tremendous job. So we're building a large design system like what Facebook has, Airbnb, all these companies. Um, and then there are a couple of us who are embedded with product teams, which is me and a couple other guys. And uh, we're the ones who are there to kind of support this rapid iteration and ideation on the products. And then also to help elevate this design system. So I'm kind of pulling double duty between those and it's been extremely satisfying. And so it was, it was a mix of background and organic um, morphing of the roles and then very intentionally looking for a job that was really going to help me bridge that gap and straddle that chasm between design and development. And um, it's given me a, much better perspective of front end and I think made me a much better developer and a better technologist to be more deeply embedded on the UX side, um, especially when it comes to building front end user experiences, because that is the, the first layer between a user and a product is, is that design, is that interaction. So it's everything from, you know, UXers tend to think of it more in terms of like information hierarchy, colors, fonts, um, basic layout, the wireframes, the journey, that kind of stuff. Um, but the thing that I found as I've grown more deeply embedded with these teams is that there's this gap of um, more complex user interactions that exists on a lot of products. And we can probably see this all across the board where it's like, hey, if someone taps an option on a menu, should that menu then auto dismiss or do we keep it out so that way that user can stay there? Oh, I think we lost our our uh, audience. It's now just you and me. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, we're going to save this for the internet. This is, uh, this okay. is for this is forever. <laughs> okay, great. Good. Um, oh, that's right. I forgot you are recording this. So, um, so yeah, that that really was an interesting thing to think about. Is that um, I wonder how many like user experience and user interaction design teams and product design teams now would really benefit from having a strong front end developer on their team. And I'm not talking about someone who like dabbles a little bit in HTML and CSS. I'm talking about someone on a more mid to senior level who intrinsically understands the technology of building complex user interactions. Um, because the thing that's really come up now in working in this hybrid space a little bit is um, we're spotting all of these gaps in assumptions about user interactions and it's fantastic. There's so much opportunity around this to see, okay, how do we prevent confusion on the end user? It may look great on a static slide. If you're giving a presentation to stakeholders or executives, or you're putting stuff into Sketch or Zeppelin and sharing the designs out. <clears throat> but then once we started really kind of using the products, meaning working in these prototypes and environments that I'm building, which are fairly complex applications, um, we started to see where either certain things would fall apart, or we could elevate a certain section of the site and then we could actually like get it out into user testing and instead of going okay you can only click these three options because this is what the prototyping software expects 
um, we're really enabling the researchers and the users now to um, to explore these in a greater parity with the real world and our, uh, our product is not in Denver, we're out of footprint, so we don't actually get to use the products we build. This is our best case scenario right now. And it allows us to really stay ahead of that competency curve and start actually building toward um, people's expectations and behaviors and understand how they're interacting with the products. And we've gotten just tremendous feedback on several of these where um, it's maybe more information becomes overwhelming even though it looks really great in a static design or once we started adding motion it actually pulled a concept together for a person and they were able to jump into using a new product that much faster so those are the types of things um, that have really come out of this process that i was not expecting um, and it's it's really it's it's made for a, a, a lot of richer possibilities when it comes to product design in the long term would you say that sort of this merging of front end with the UX uh, team and, and, you know, the concept of a design technologist, is that coming more, is that like the future of front end engineering or like where would you say kind of the, the market is right now um, from your, from the, the engineer's perspective? Hmm. I think the market is still slow on the uptick on this one. Um, okay. I only work in, you know, the, the bubble in which I inhabit, but from talking to other developers, it's funny because when I explain to other developers what I do, they go, oh my God, that sounds amazing. We totally need this for my team. Trying to make a use case for companies to intrinsically change the way that they structure their teams is always very hard. Um, so I still see less of it. I still see a lot of designers who just want to like, the and i don't think it's i don't think it's teams i don't think it's individuals so much i think it's just a systemic thing this is like by design the way the companies have built it where they they want teams to iterate rapidly in an agile way whether that's lean or scrum or what have you but then um they still kind of want this handoff process to happen versus people working shoulder to shoulder on things and my team has done some interesting exploratory processes um there's a concept called hot potato which brad frost who's the um author of the book Atomic Design. He's done this with, um, with uh, developers in the past where they will sit down for two hours and just jam on something back and forth. They're literally working shoulder to shoulder. And my team did a couple projects like this and we were able to build like design from scratch and quickly build fully working applications in two hours. Um, and it's, it is just absolutely staggering mm -hmm. how much faster it is actually to collaborate more directly like that and also, um, how um, much less miscommunications there are, which means the less time going back and, and um, resolving things, fixing things, rethinking something. Once you're, once you're really kind of iterating on stuff in the moment, it, it clears up a lot of ambiguities and allows teams to move that much quicker. And to me, in kind of a more satisfying way. Not everyone is big on collaborating. Some people just want to receive a spec, go off and do their thing. Um, but yeah, it seems like front end is, has still not caught up to this idea. And my boss and I have, have talked about like starting to give talks on this topic, talk about how prototyping is more than just a really rapid click through in something like Envision um, and really try to pioneer this process that solid, effective front end development, it happens that much easier when you're more closely married to your designers. Yeah. Yeah, sort of like shorten that communication gap. Mm -hmm. If you're kind of, is that kind of the concept too of pair programming that you're like coding together rather than like one, like in a chain, you know, um, handing off and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And typically, I mean, working, there's something to be said for heads down, kind of like traditional deep work time. Um, right. We all, you know, there's, there is science behind this, but at the same time, if you're not in a situation where you have to do deep work, then it's usually almost better to be working with someone because that way you're not making decisions in a vacuum. You have someone else to bounce ideas off of, um, that kind of thing. I think it's a, it's a little more challenging right now because of COVID and it's, it's, uh, it's harder to collaborate over distance in that way. Um, but I've seen people come up with genius ways of doing it, you know, back and forth screen sharing, um, just doing like daily kind of design review meetings, doing a lot more demos, stuff like that. And so it's definitely still happening. And I think it's, um, it's very useful, especially, 
I mean, for developers of all levels, like it's useful for juniors because the time spent with designers, with other developers, it's going to level them up that much faster. For mid-levels, it's going to help them kind of elevate their game. And then I think for senior levels too, it brings us back down to earth a little bit because I like being stopped and asked questions about what I'm doing or why, especially if it's about something that I've kind of taken for granted that I've done for maybe the last five years. And someone will ask me, you know, hey, what, why are you writing a fat arrow function? And I'm like, that's a really good question. Let's look up fat arrow functions. <laughs> why am I? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think it's super important just kind of all across the board to do more collaborative work like that. Big time. I mean, and collaboration in general and the more people that are looking at things and thinking through things it's like we have so many different types of customers it makes sense that you would want so many different types of people working on solving for those customers and the more opinions and more thoughts like the more rich of a product and an experience you'll create um, that's mm -hmm. awesome i love hearing this direction that's happening and that's just happening for you and your career um one a key hallmark of the the conversation and the training as you know uh, that we do here at Recruiting Innovation is we really, um, we like to kind of ground our, our stories and our, our trainings for the recruiting audience in the, the workflow approach, um, the journey map approach, which you mentioned as a UX tool um, and the concept of, you know, in software development, it's the five steps, research, design, build, test, deploy. And it's not, you know, linear, it obviously can all happen sort of concurrently. But with that, I would love to hear um, maybe an example project that you've recently worked on um, that you think was cool or particularly challenging. Um, and I'd just love to hear, yeah, a, a project example of something you've been working on. Yeah, um, let's see here. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I can share I can share a fairly decent amount without violating any kind of non-disclosure. Oh, there you go, um, yeah, don't get in trouble. So, yeah, there, this is something not out in the wild yet but like none of our none of our projects are like skunk works or anything like that so um we're dealing with a, a thing on video where we have wanted customers to basically be able to pick channels in an a la carte fashion and a lot of cable companies are kind of moving in this direction i think comcast is also doing this dish um and some other providers and the whole idea is that not everyone needs like 500 channels and wants to pay 160 bucks a month for that. Most people watch about 10 channels. And so that was kind of the, um, the research and the hypothesis that we wanted to prove is can, are people interested in, in this offering as a service? And then can they actually move through basically picking a set of channels from a group, adding it to basically a shopping cart and then seeing it all the way through to the end. And so I was helping, with this process and so we took in a bunch of data from users um we we grabbed the most popular channels that are being offered on cable tv what are people watching the most um also what's offering like compelling original content because that is such a huge consideration right now when compared to things like netflix and hulu and prime video and all of these um kind of proprietary providers who you know original content is basically the lifeblood right now of, of video products and services yeah. it's, you know offering something exclusively that you can only watch on that platform and that really gives these providers a compelling selling point where it's like you might not like netflix as an interface but if you want to watch tiger king you got to subscribe to netflix um at least for that month until you get through tiger king and then you can go back to whatever you're doing um so we um so we pulled this information and then we started to kind of build a list of hypotheses of, you know, where is the user potentially going to fall apart? How much do we want to put on the education page? How do we pull them into this? And then um, on the design side, we have just really strong, passionate designers on video and I love it. And so we had a couple different ideas of kind of like levels of richness of the experience, you know, a single splash page with a couple examples, and then we put them right into the flow and see how they select channels, and then how do they go back um, and delete channels, edit them. A lot of this was really geared toward a user research and testing process. Yep. And so um, then we had some slightly more complicated designs showing kind of examples of how it would work. It was a much longer education page. Um, it was, and we were trying to find that sweet spot between engagement and um, 
and overwhelming the user you know where where is that middle ground and so from a development perspective once i started diving into this we were also trying to test both web experience and people using this on something like a roku or an apple tv with a remote control yeah. so i had to build two separate prototypes and one was just you click around you can accomplish the goal remote control based very different um so for example if you have a a, a grid of content that you're trying to select from like a list of channels or a list of TV shows and then you press up on your remote control maybe there's a drop down so our question became like okay if you press up on the remote control does that drop down need to open immediately or do you have to select it first these are like I was talking about these are like the more complex interactions where we want to fill in the gaps um, and you really need like actual front-end code to accomplish this because there's no way to tell if this is going to be disruptive to a user um, and it was less about, is this technologically possible? It was more about what kinds of pitfalls can we avoid that's going to make a user bail on this process and not reach their goal. Um, so we had things like that come up. And so I was building a lot of these kind of um, variations on the interactions, variations on the education page, variations on how the drop down might work, um, variations on how we wanted to arrange the channels. Did we want it by genre? Did we want it alphabetically? Did we want it by popularity? Um, and then how does the user navigate those channel sets? Or do we just give them like all 120 and see if they can actually find what they need? Um, so the, the dev part was extremely important to this and then being able to pull in new channels if we needed to quickly. Um, pulling in channels based on different subscription tiers, whatever the user picked. Um, and so uh, then when we reached the testing phase, it was, um, it was literally right when the stay at home order started. And so unfortunately, the TV experience had to go by the wayside because we needed to pull people physically into a room and have them pick up a remote and surf through this can't do it with stay at home orders. There's no way to do it safely. Like they wouldn't be able, we couldn't bring in, you know, 20 unrelated strangers to go and test this for us. It, it was decided like, no, this is not safe to do right now. We got to wait. Um, but we were able to do a great deal of online testing and it gave us some good direction on where people were making assumptions, kind of where our own assumptions fell down. Um, things like we, we had a counter for how many channels people could select that were remaining. People were keeping count in their head. Like we apparently weren't making it obvious enough that we were keeping track of, of what they had selected. Um, so things like that came up. And so we did a second round of testing, got, um, got a bunch of that information assimilated, changed up a couple of things and actually got much higher um, conversion rates to the end of that user journey really, really quickly, um, which was terrific. Like more, it, we found out more education was better. We found out that um, just moving the location of the of the countdown table of of people being able to see what they chose like something that seems that innocuous actually made a huge difference and so those are the types of things that um is is why the technology side of this is so super important because we were able to go in and just kind of move some things around add some content and then we could test it again whereas redesigning that and then like putting all of that back into a, a um software as a service prototype, it still would have been like those, those constant roadblocks of, oh, you can't click that, you have to click this instead, whereas mine, you could go anywhere you wanted, work exactly like it would in the real world. And so we're not yet at the deploy phase, but basically the um, developers on the teams who are going to be deploying this, we don't share the same code base. So my work never actually sees the light of day, which takes a lot of pressure off of what I do. There you um, go but the prototypes and the code base can get handed off to our production development team so they can see what's the logic I wrote, how is it being put in there, okay, where is she getting the channel data from, and then also just filling in the gaps for them, like, hey, here's what's going to happen with the drop down when you select it, here's how the education page looks, here is the speed of the video on this kind of like demo sizzle reel that we have in the middle, and this is the one that hit hardest with the users, so use that speed, like make, make these things, you know, cascade all across the board, and so, Mm, excuse me, that is, uh, 
that is, that's the most recent project I work on. And it's been one of the most fulfilling, like getting to watch the videos of people testing this, seeing how they're using the technology, using these products that I work on, and then being able to collaborate with a lot of really excited designers who, who want to bring about like these positive changes to the user experience when it comes to telecom. It's, uh, it's been very satisfying and very eye opening on what assumptions we had made um, around how users would do things like pick channels. Um, and then how those assumptions basically fell on their faces. I love learning from mistakes like that. Well, and that's like why you have a user experience based team because as the mantra is like as a developer or a product manager or builder, we are inherently not the user. And so whatever we think is inherently not accurate or, you know, it, we're not the audience. So mm -hmm. it is cool to be able to, to see things in the wild. So if I understand correctly, your role you are doing like the development and testing, but you're doing it within like sort of the concept prototyping stage. And then once you're go, then it actually goes to a team that does a full build. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that's or, correct. Okay, okay. So it's almost like two tiers of like the design test build for your, you're, you're validating a whole bunch before you commit real dev hours, which is just so smart. <laughs> yeah. Especially, uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of what I do is is trying to find like very quick shortcuts. So maybe instead of building a full API for data, I'm just going to pull in static JSON data to get a proof of concept going. Or instead of piping in like live TV broadcasts, I just pull in an MP4 capture from, you know, Parks and Rec or something like that. And so I get to basically it's it's just like nonstop sandboxing. I get to take all these like nice little shortcuts that still can help facilitate the goal, help us suspend disbelief. Um, but then there are also plenty of opportunities, um, like with something like speech recognition, where we've gone in to these third party providers that, that do things like um, voice to text and, and whatnot, and get to test their APIs, give ourselves that ability to play, and then we will actually hand off the code we wrote to the production development teams and go, hey, here is how we took in input from the user from the microphone and then here's how we converted it and here's how we sent it to the speech rec provider and here's how we handled the data that came back and a lot of those teams do reuse our code and so that comes in really really handy when it comes to big heavy projects like that because we are able to do some of that more medium weight lifting and do it in a slightly more controlled environment that also gives production development teams, something that they can view and test against and vet um, ideas. It, it almost works kind of like a um, like slightly different staging environment for them. And so that also eliminates them constantly having to go back to a product owner or a, um, or a project manager or a designer and go like, hey, I don't know how this is supposed to work. They can look at my prototypes and go, oh, this is the behavior. Here's the size. Here's the style. Here's how it's pulling in our design system. And then they just take it and they can run with it. Yeah, and I can, I can see the benefit too is like, it's almost like your role and, and your team is like the intermediary between the full design user and like the actual code. So it's sort of like ensuring the translation a little bit better than just sending some wires over to front end, you know? Exactly. Mm, cool. And then is there a different team fully that does deployment? You probably don't do, you, do are you involved with deployment at all in the role that you're doing Not now? At all. No, thankfully, right. like our, I know that our deployment system is complicated and huge being a company, Massive. you know, the second largest cable company in the country. Um, and so when it comes to getting things out the door, um, I am more than happy to relinquish all of that knowledge and control to those teams. Great. Yeah. Yeah. You be the specialist that you're at and I'll uh, be over here or doing what I'm doing. Yeah. That's Absolutely. nice to be able to, de to delegate that. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that story with us. Um, sure. Maybe two small questions to round out the topic. Um, one thing that comes up often when I'm working with recruiters and we're talking about technology or when they're, you know, having, getting to ask questions of technologists, a lot of it is around interviewing. So are there certain questions, like what's a good question that a recruiter can ask where you're like, oh, that's a good question. I'm glad that they asked that. Are there certain kind of questions as, that recruiters can ask you or someone like you that is just like a solid question that makes you feel like, okay, they know what I'm, I'm doing, I do, and that you know, brings out a good answer from you? Mm -hmm. 
Um, the number one question I love to hear from recruiters or anyone is basically, how do you like to work? What's your ideal team composition? How do you like to collaborate? Um, because that one will bring about such a broad range of answers. And I think that one really helps get at, I mean, how somebody works. And that's super important because like I said, there are certain people who really like to go heads down. They're not, they, they just, they really like to, to descend into that headspace with the noise canceling headphones and crank out code. And they do a wonderful job doing it. And I do believe that there are plenty of jobs out there who like need those, those individuals who have that heavy level of focus, who really want to dive deep. And then there are people like me who can handle context switching quickly and who really like collaboration, liveliness, a little bit more like that. Um, I think the the assumption that all programmers are just like introverted neckbeardy types who would prefer not to not to work in in a in a um, in a more collaborative environment is becoming patently more and more false. And um, just knowing to me that says that that recruiter is mindful of like what does that team look like. And I think that's something else that is helpful is like getting to know the team that's being hired for. Understand what is the director or VP of engineering want. What is the team looking for in terms of an individual? What's, what, what are the dynamics of the team now and do they like it or do they want to change it? Would bringing in someone on a different energy level disrupt things too much or is it like an injection of energy or an injection of calmness that that team needs either in order to elevate or to ground a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's, that's one of the most important ones just and just like getting to know like how does the person that you're trying to hire, like how, how do they want to work? Where do they want to be? What's going to drive them to be at their best? Um, and that's the kind of thing that will keep people in jobs. It will keep people effective. It'll keep people motivated and productive. Um, you know, especially, especially in times like now where, where right. people struggle. So that, that for me is always kind of the number one question that I always really enjoy hearing above what's your favorite framework or what excites you right now? Like, I really want to know what I, I want them to get to know me and what I'm looking for in, in that space. And that's a good point too, because as you know, recruiters, that would help us filter you to the right appropriate opportunity, because we should know the teams that we're recruiting for and the dynamics there. And um, it's not just work and roles and abilities and years experience, it's like a match. And is it, you know, there's qualitative and quantitative, and that really speaks to sort of the qualitative character of, of a candidate matched to the team. And that's awesome. Um, Mm -hmm. Any questions that are sort of red flags for you or that recruiters should stop asking? Red flag for me is always questions around like how many hours I want to work. Oh. Uh, I am past the point where I'm okay with like putting in late nights and weekends. There are companies that need that for whatever reason. There are teams that thrive on it. I thrived on it for over a decade. I'm just done with it. Um, but that to me, it's, a, it's another one of those um, kind of qualitative questions of what, what kind of environment do you want to be in? Um, and then <sighs> questions recruiters should stop asking. Stop asking about salary history. Oh, it's actually not, it's actually illegal to ask that question now. Good. FYI. I still, yes. I still hear about that happening. So it's good to know that that's illegal. I'll start, I'll start tipping off the people I know who have had, you know, internal and external pushy recruiters saying like, hey, well, we really need to know what your last job was paying you. And it's like, no, you actually don't. You that is a good reminder. Yeah, I'm going to make a note of that to share with the group. Yeah, I think it, at least I need to double check where I found that I think it was like at the federal level even. Because yeah. the thing is, is like, if you've always been underpaid, you're a marginal, you know, you're in, in a minority category, great, now you're just going to perpetuate the imbalance, thanks, you know, it's just, yeah, no, mm -hmm. um, it should all be about like market rate. And if I, I'm really actually for, and this comes with like the diversity recruiting, like roles should have salary bandings. If you're interviewing for the mid-level, mid-level pay 75 to 90 you know, what have you, and it's a banding. And then you get put in the banding based on your seniority within the group. And it's a way of being fair. And then that way, you know, an engineer too, you're going to be within a 10K range of everyone else on your team based on whatever else. So 
Yeah. That's ex excellent. Yes. Anything else? Any, any other tidbits or thoughts you would like to share with our recruiting audience before we uh, wrap up? I'm trying to think. Um, nothing I can really think of, honestly. Um, I haven't, I haven't interviewed at another company in two and a half years. So I'm a, I'm a little rusty on that side, which is, which is a good thing. Um, yes. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's kind of the big thing because before this, I was a serial job hopper and I think like good, good mindful recruiting can pair the right person with the right opportunity. And, and it is, like you said, it's more about those qualitative metrics. It's about what environment is going to make a person thrive. What kind of boss employee dynamic is going to make a person thrive? What kind of team? Uh, and to me, that has become the biggest thing right now in the game is, is finding that right fit. And, you know, especially right now, I know I've had a lot of friends who've gotten laid off. They've been furloughed. They've experienced pay cuts, but this was even happening before. Like tech is such a weirdly volatile industry. And um, I think it's also important to approach interviewing people with that level of kindness, because I know for the most part, developers, like we, we tend to get, um, for lack of a better term, a little bit gun shy in the interview process because it feels like there is so much pressure exerted on us to perform in an interview. And this, this cascades all the way down through the teams. I don't think this is necessarily a recruiter thing, but I think this is where recruiters may be able to train their clients to adjust their expectations a little bit better um, because interviewing for tech work, it's, it's exhausting. It's a little terrifying. It's anxiety inducing for a lot of people. And at the end of the day, because pretty much everyone I know who's worked in this industry has been laid off at least once. I have, and I've narrowly escaped several others in the past on, uh, on previous teams. But um, it basically means that we're, we're essentially being asked to show a high level of investment for something that's not a sure thing. And that's a, that's a tough sell to, to, to get people to buy in on. And so I think a lot of the time, instead of thinking about like, oh, well, what's, what's the long-term potential in this? It's like, is this, is this something that's going to help facilitate your goals and your career path and make you happy and productive and feel like your career has meaning right now? Um, and then usually from there, a job can kind of morph into something else. And so seeing, seeing things as a little bit less of a means to an end, uh, I think has been a really helpful mindset shift that I've seen both myself and several other people that I know kind of take in both the job hunt and just kind of like the, the having a dev career process. Got it. Yeah, you made some really good points in there in terms of like, I, I like how you said a certain level of kindness. I think that, you know, everyone in an interview process has their own responsibilities and pressures of, and the role that they're exhibiting. And as recruiters, considering that we're the node in all of it, the more that we can be empathetic and um, uh, show kindness to our candidates and help them feel supported and like, you know, build them up because recognizing that it is nerve wracking. And you and I've had this conversation too. It's like mm -hmm. when you're looking for a job and that company wants you to commit two sets of three hours, like you can only go to the dentist so many times in a month, right? Well, you got to get yeah. out of your job. And so like as companies and as talent folks, putting ourselves in the shoes of the candidate and realizing that we're asking a lot of them. And so what can we do to pare down, like you said, adjust our expectations and how our flow is so we can meet in the middle and not expect someone to take a half day twice or what have you to just mm -hmm. come in and for a chance at getting a job. Right. Like, and if you're doing that multiple times, it's like, it, it's exhausting. And that's, I, I appreciate that reminder that as recruiters, we can do uh, a little bit better to, um, be more generous and thoughtful and uh, empathetic toward the candidates that we're working with. For sure. Hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. I always really enjoy chatting with you and I'm thank excited. You. Yeah. And I'm excited for the role that you're in. I'm excited that they have you because I know what a multi-tool energetic uh, person you are and sounds like it's a great fit and you're working on big problems and I'm, I love hearing about the current state of things and the idea of design technologist. That's a new, another new title that I haven't even heard yet. So nope. um, thanks for making time to share your perspective and experience with us. Absolutely. Always happy to do it. 
Awesome. Well, everyone, uh, Morgan Daly, she is a senior prototype architect at Charter and uh, also the front end engineering instructor on the recruiting innovation tech recruiter certification program. So if you have any questions on that, check out uh, recruitinginnovation.com. I'm your host, Allison Daly. Thanks for being here. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.